How's everybody feel? Good. Thank you for being here. I know it took a lot to come from wherever you came from and make the decision to be here. And my commitment, and it's also the commitment of Janet and Karen and all the speakers, is that today is a life-changing day. That there's something at stake for each one of you. That maybe you're looking for proof of life after death. Or maybe you have someone that may be close to dying or has a fear of dying, and you really want some answers. And my commitment to you is that you get that and you get a whole lot more. You meet friends here that you'll have for life and that today really is life changing. So my name is Sandra Champlain. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm nervous as anything. If you were in my body right now, my knees are shaking. I feel my voice quivering. I am just getting over a cold, so I'm frightened that I'm gonna start coughing. I know at the 10 minute left mark, Janet's gonna give me a big sign and I'm really worried that I'm not gonna be able to say everything I wanna say. So here's the deal. If that happens, even if it doesn't happen, I have loads of books out on my book table. Feel free to grab one, keep it with you today, read through it, look at it. If you wanna buy it, great. If you don't, just put it back on the table. But while I'm here, I'll give you everything I've got. I know there are some people that won't be able to make my um, talks this afternoon about grief, and that's why I wanted to make sure in each one of your bags is my audio called How to Survive Grief. So I'll be talking about more than that, and you know the, the DVDs will be available after. So are you ready? Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm Sandra Champlain. Not predictable that I would have a book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death because who I am out in the real world, as I call it, is I'm a chef. I cook for race car teams. I'm on the road. I've cooked for Paul Newman. I've cooked for Patrick Dempsey, plays, plays Dr. McDreamy on Grey's Anatomy. Um, I've worked, I've done some great things. I also own a small business in Connecticut. I own a coffee and chocolate store. And I started that, I think, 23 years ago. And I'm not currently there behind the counter. I have a beautiful general manager who's working it so that I can be doing this. So how did I get involved in this? If you come back with me to about 1996, I woke up one day with this incredible fear of dying. And I don't know, has anybody else felt that? There are moments that we look up at the stars and, you know, who am I? And, what is my life for and is there any purpose? And there's times that we go through an incredible amount of pain and suffering and we can't understand why. And all of this, and of course I had lost some loved ones, I had worked in a nursing home when I was a teenager and I would go into work and some of the residents would be gone. And I think all of that probably had something to do with this incredible fear. Well, the fear wouldn't go away as much as I looked for answers. And I started uh, with church, with religion, and as we heard last night, all the faiths believe in life after death, but it wasn't enough to soothe that fear. So very secretly, I went out on a journey. And my subtitle is A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Because if you knew the Sandra back in 1996 to 2003, four, five, I was someone that would have never shown up at a conference like this. If you were someone who would speak about your angels or seeing a medium or a psychic, you know what I'd think about you? Oh my goodness, you know, get a life. That stuff's not real. I'd walk through a bookstore and I'd see the spiritual new age section and I would just shake my head, you know? So I ended up going on this journey and it started out with me thinking, okay, I'm not getting an answer from religion. Well, maybe some of that medium stuff might be real. And as luck would have it, I started having some strange experiences. Um, have you ever thought of a person and then all of a sudden the phone rings and it's them? Well, I had that happening. I had gotten into a cab and I heard a name in my mind and I introduced myself to the cab driver, and that was his name, what I just heard in my mind. 
I started hearing like an Elvis Presley song in my mind, and I'd turn on the radio, and it's on. And that kind of cracked the door open to that there's something more. And in time, and I'll get into this in my proof of life after death phase that I'll share with you, but in time, I gathered so much incredible, what I call evidence, that we survive physical death that over the course of, it took about 15 years of just pulling things in here and there and everywhere. And of course, I didn't tell anybody about it because I wanted people to still like me. And I knew, <laughs> I knew that, you know, other pro people probably thought people were crazy that believed in this. So I didn't want to lose friends. I didn't want my family to know what I was up to. Um, so I got all the evidence, I call it evidence, at about 2005. And my fears were completely rested. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that we don't die, we go on. Somewhere, the little voice inside of me said, you know, you should tell people about this because people would like to know, but who am I? I'm just a cook. I don't know how to write a book. Who would even listen to me? You know, we all have that voice inside of our head, don't we? We wake up in the morning, maybe we want to hit the snooze button, we don't want to start the day. We look in the mirror, is that what I really look like? You know, oh, the gray hairs are peeking out. You know, um, I'm always beating up on myself for being too heavy and not being able to get my weight under control. And what are people gonna think of me? If I'm saying you can have a great life, well, what's wrong with her? You know, I, this, we have this constant chatter in our heads. People call it the negative Nancy or the inner critic. Um, I call it the voice. And I personally think that right now, sitting in the room, your voices are talking. And our voice, it's autopilot. We can't control what it says. But what I'm gonna ask everybody is while you're here, I mean, there may be people, and if I, if I were you way back when, I'd be like, yeah, you show me. You, you show me that there's life after death. You prove it to me. And whatever your voice is saying right now, my request is just set it aside, and you be present, and you just listen. Okay, so my voice really convinced me that I'm a nobody and my voice doesn't matter and who's going to listen to me. So I got very busy with my life, being a cook, traveling, having my chocolate shop. And in 2010, January, my wonderful father is diagnosed with cancer. And I relocate from Massachusetts to Daytona Beach, Florida, and I moved in with my dad and his lady friend. Dad was 74. And over the five months before my dad passed away, I was right by his side. I really, um, I was one of these kids that I saw dad once a year. We talked on the phone every couple of weeks. And boy, I fell in love with my dad. I mean, it was the most magnificent time of my life. When people say, what are you the most proud of? It's like I felt like this might sound kind of cheesy, but I was the cruise director planning excursions for my dad. He was in hospice, he was in, hos in the hospital, um, in and out of all kinds of things. But I would bring movies to his room and I would, we played this game that every person that came into the room, um, they're gonna leave a little happier when they leave. You know, what can we do, what can we say? Dad and I played something called the gratitude game. We went back and forth, well, what are you grateful for? And he'd say something, well, well I top this, what are you grateful for? And all of that really made him feel better. And Dad died May 11th, 2010. And what happened before his death, and certainly after, is I started getting into these unbelievable arguments with my siblings. Now, I have siblings very much like me, open-minded, fun, want to make a difference, love people. We always got along. It was never predictable what happened. We started fighting. We started fighting about, you know, before Dad died, what's going to happen? You know, how is he going to be dealt with here? Um, they, he was living in Florida uh, while I was gone at one of the races. They flew in to take him on a private jet back to Connecticut where they lived without telling me. I mean, this whole thing came about. And so, yeah, it sounds awful. And I'm thinking, why are they doing this? And they said, well, dad said that's what he wants. And dad's calling me saying, Sandra, they're going to move me. I don't want to go. 
And basically, not only did dad die, but the relationships with my three siblings died. So I didn't just lose dad, I lost my siblings, who I love, right? And I went into the deepest, most painful thing I have ever experienced. I've never been someone to say, I'm going to commit suicide or you know, even speak that, because that's not me. But in that deep, nasty place, I realized that if other people feel this way, I can see why they'd want out. So I had a lot of compassion. And some, you know, I'm a researcher, and I love to learn. And something said, this is grief. This is all part of grief. And I thought, you know, we hear about grief, and we hear about the different things that will happen. But what turns great, loving people into monsters? Why is there the greed? Why is there the fighting? Why did I have a conversation with my sister, and she didn't understand me? And she told my other siblings, like, a lie about me. Why does that happen? So I went on this journey to discover grief. And yes, I found many of the things that we know about grief. But what I also found, which I was my aha moment, is that what happens in the brain when we grieve, when we suffer a loss, and it can be a death of a loved one, it can be a loss of a job, it can be you lose a relationship, whether it's a divorce or someone you're close to, um, the empty nest syndrome when your kid goes off to school, if you're, you are diagnosed with an illness, or your health changes, or your finances change, grief kicks in. Anytime we have a connection, and then there's a split, and there's a loss, this world of grief kicks in. Now, as human beings, we are not educated about grief. Nowhere in school are we told about grief. We can assume when we lose somebody we love, it hurts. And in this day and age, people are like, well, you know, it's been two weeks. Aren't you over it yet? You know, or maybe you get three days off if a loved one dies from work. You know, I found out years ago, and especially in European countries, people would get six months to a year off. Yes, they'd wear black. In some countries, they wore an armband for a year. And people would know, well, they're grieving. And they would treat them with compassion and respect. In our society, we don't see death very often. People die in nursing homes or in hospitals, and all of a sudden, you get a phone call that so-and-so died, and oh man, grief kicks in like crazy. Years ago, um, people would have, a, you know, in their home, in their parlor, they'd have the wake for a, a loved one or a funeral, something like that, and, or our elders would die at home. You know, so death still hurt, but it was more normal and we could expect it. In this day and age, not so much. So in my grief explorations, when we have such a significant loss, there are chemicals in our brain. And we always hear about these chemicals, like, um, you know, there's a, there's a chemical endorphin rush you get, you know, when you exercise or if you tell jokes and you feel better. I mean, there's all this stuff happening in your brain. Well, there's actually a neurotransmitter responsible for our mood, our memory, our communication, our perception, our sleep. Um, and when we grieve, say we have 100% functioning chemicals in our brain, when we grieve, it could drop down to about 10%. So that answers why there's so much pain and sadness and the crying and the, and the physical things associated with grief, which many of us know about. Um, we can lose sleep, or we could want to sleep all the time. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this, but your memory really stinks when you're grieving. Well, that's because you don't have enough of this chemical happening in your brain. But what I didn't realize is without these chemicals in your brain, your view of the occurring world might not be what it really is. Now, you hear about this even if you have a healthy brain. If you have a car accident and two people were asked to tell their, what happened, and we've heard this, they tell different stories. Right? It's because we can only perceive and take in so much information, and you know, we tell it the best we can. Now, that's a healthy brain. Well, a grieving brain, wow, I could be looking at you, and you're wearing yellow, and after today, grieving, oh, you had a great red jacket on. You know, it's just, it's so off. 
But we're living in our own skin, so we don't realize this. We're thinking it's the truth. And all of a sudden came, wow, I had that conversation with my sister, and she really thought I said this, but I said this. Wow. And then I thought of so many things that were tied in with grief, with the family, with the communication, with the perception. And it's something like 40 to 45% of sibling relationships come apart when a parent dies. 80% of couples get divorced when a child dies. 90% of couples get divorced when one of them has a life-threatening illness. And there's over a million grief-related suicides a year. So me said, people need to know about this. And so I sat at home and I wrote something called How to Survive Grief. I took my digital tape recorder and I spoke into it for 70 minutes and I posted this online. I bought the domain name survivegrief.com. You could go there and you could download it or you could press play. I'm not a big um, marketer or anything like that, but I made about five posts on Facebook about it. And within a matter of three months, over 3,000 people in 15 countries heard it. I started getting emails about how it eased pain, how it gave hope, how people were sharing it with their siblings to work through a death as opposed to fighting. And then someone told me, looked me right in the eye and said, I was gonna end my life. And this was a, a divorce that caused the grief. A man had lost his wife, she had left him for another man. And he said, I was in the deepest, worst place I have ever been. And he said, I already had my exit strategy planned. And then he said, then I listened to your audio. And he says, three times, it was like you were talking just to me, Sandra. You knew everything that was happening in my mind. And he said, and I chose to live. I used your tools to get out of it. And so I started getting other emails in about a young lady whose brother had accidentally killed himself playing with a BB gun. And that was in the UK and, and different things. And it's, I thought, geez, maybe I should think about getting this out there. Just think about it. And so one of the things I had done is really wrestled with this voice in my mind because everything inside me was yelling, you're not the one, who's going to listen to you? And so one day, I, I just decided I'm, I'm, I can't even deal with my own thoughts anymore. And I took myself to the movies to get away from myself. And I picked what was rated as a comedy, and it was called 50-50. And it had some fun actors in it and things. I was like, that's the one. So I take myself to the movie, and it's a story of a young man who gets cancer. And he's dealing with his humanity as he watches the friends that were having chemotherapy with him die. And I, I'm not going to go through the whole movie, but the bottom line is what came up for me is there's a ton of pain in the world. There's 52 million people in our world that die every year. And it's not just one person that grieves when a person dies, it's a ton. There's a lot of pain. And I thought to myself, gosh, I need to get this out somehow. And as silly as this sounds, just to release everything that was in my heart, after I got out of the movie theater, you know, I'm crying and I had wacky hair and no makeup on. I sat in the car, seatbelt on, with my new iPhone, and I look into the phone. I'm Sandra Champlain, and I want to tell you my story just to get it out of me. So it's a, I think it's a 27-minute video that I'm just looking at the camera. And one of my friends had lost a loved one, and she says, can I, can I see your video? And I sent it to her, but don't show anybody. Because, <laughs> you know, the hair is bad, the tears, you know, I don't even know what I was wearing. And she says, Sandra, that's amazing, can I share it? Well, it's been shared now almost a thousand times, and that's just the video. So people would start saying, you've got to tell this. Well, how does a person who has a dream in their heart get it out? So I decided, okay, got to do something. Let my fingers do the typing, went on the internet, found a weekend retreat called Author 101 University. 
if you have a dream of being an author, we'll help you. So I went, and it was bigger, a little bit bigger group than this. And people would say, well, why are you here? And I said, I wanted to write a book. And they said, well, what kind of book? And I knew in my heart that I wanted this grief information to be out, but very few people go out of their way, number one, to realize they're grieving, and number two, to go buy a book on it. And I thought, geez, if I could be courageous and share with people my life after death, that that might rope them in. And then I share everything that I learned about life after death, put in that one chapter about grief, which is my grief audio. Like I said, each one of you have that, sorry, in your bag. But they get that information. And who I am, and I think you can tell that, I've met many of you, is I'm very much about life. You know, if we're not afraid of dying, we don't have to be afraid of living. We can be afraid and we can take action anyways. Everything in my system is saying, was saying, don't get up on stage, don't get up on stage. What are they gonna think? You know, do you have lipstick on your teeth? How's your hair? What's gonna, are you gonna cough? And it doesn't matter because this message is so much bigger than me. So I was in the audience at Author 101 and I was telling everybody I wanted to write a grief book. I was just too scared. And the, the day was over, the last day, and I'm walking out the door. And a man grabs me, and he says, hey, why were you here? And he was the publisher of Morgan James Publishing, the owner. And it was like that moment that I could say, grief, or I could say, Sandra, tell him the truth. And so I said, I think it's a long story. He says, I've got time. So David Hancock is his name. And he sat with me, everybody else cleared out. And he's very Christian. And even though I'm Catholic, man, some of the stuff that I learned about life after death, I thought people are gonna think I'm crazy. This guy is, well, he held my hands and he says, you just tell me. So the story came out and the story came out about what I learned and the story came out about grief and what I really wanna write is this book to help people live a powerful life now. And he says, do you think you can write that? Have you written before? No. So this is just lesson number one. No matter what your mind is saying you can or you cannot do, you can. There's a way. You just get into communication. And when he said to me, why are you here? That opened the door for a whole new world. So while you're here, there's plenty of people you don't know. And it's a really nice icebreaker to say, hey, why are you here? And I tell you what, you might hear what you came here for from somebody on stage or you might hear it from somebody who's an exhibitor or just somebody else in the conference. So that's my request. Will you take it on? Just ask people, why are you here? Thank you. So in a nutshell, I decide to write a few chapters. This is what I want to write. And I sent it to David. And he said, how soon can you have this written? This, this is something big. And so, OK, I spent two months and just unloaded it all from my head. And the book was published maybe six months later. I met a group of people that were just phenomenal lovers of the book. Um, they promoted it to their list. People started reading it, and it hit number one in the US in the grief category and in Canada. Uh, just recently, I was on a great show called Coast to Coast AM that's played in the wee hours, and over 600 AM stations in North America played it, and it hit number one again, US, and now the UK and Canada in the grief category. It hit number four, top motivational book on Amazon. I was right up there with Dr. Phil. <laughs> and now the emails start coming in. There was, a, there was a woman who lost her husband, and she locked herself in her house for five months. I'll just give you a couple. It, for five months, and her daughter said, Mom, we want you to read this book. I don't want to read that book. That's not my kind of thing. Well, they left it in her house anyways. And this woman is now out embracing her life, taking country line dancing classes and out. There's a man in South Africa that got one as a gift, older man who had lost his wife of many, many years. The family thought, you know, dad will probably never read this. Well, not only has he read it, but he's got just about every page crimped down because it's loaded with motivational uh, sayings and not so much poems, but quotes and things like that. 
and he's out with his friends, and if they're having a bad day, well, let's just turn to right here, you know, and, and make the difference for him. Another woman wrote me, her husband had died three years ago. Her, who knows how she found the book, I think she got the Kindle, and she said she's been to grief support groups and counselors and uh, through her religion and everything, and nothing has eased the pain or she hasn't been able to move on. She says, then I read chapter 10, and I'm free. So I am on this mad dash. People are like, what's your next book? What's your next book? It's like, yeah, there's no next book just yet. We want to get this far. So when Janet and Karen asked me to be here today, it's like, you betcha I'll be here. Because every single one of us is important. And if there can be something to give you hope and ease pain, I'm going to do it. So let's get into some of the things I found. The first thing that really opened to my eyes to life after death being real is I took a course with Doreen Virtue, who is, some of you know her. She is a medium, she's a psychic, she believes in the angels. Who she used to be was a psychologist. And she got so many of these messages in her mind that she went out of that and, and into the spiritual nature. And I took a very private course with her and 20 people, and the course was called Medium Mentorship. At the end of three days, you will be somebody who can tell the deceased people around others. Now, this was right back in the beginning when I was so skeptical. I thought, there's no way this is possible. Not possible. No way. But, like, I had to know. So one of the things she had us do was take a partner. Like I said, only 20 of us in the room. We had just gotten there. And she said, listen, we're not really going to do a medium reading now. We are going to just, this is how we do it when the time comes. So she says, basically, take someone's hands, and I want you to imagine that your hearts are connecting, just this invisible energy. And she says, like, create like this safe space, like this bubble of safe space and love around you. And she says, ask if there's any loved ones that want to come through, that it's a safe place. And she says, because we're just practicing, I want you to make up that there is a human being standing behind your partner. Close your eyes for this. And she says, just make up a person. And she said, and then you just tell the story. And very often there's this profound message that comes. So I can do that. You know, I'm creative. I'm a chef, right? I can, I'll make up people. So I hold her hands. My eyes are closed. And I said to this woman, I said, okay, I'm seeing a man behind you over here. He's got blonde hair and blue eyes and a big gap between his two front teeth. His skin is really windburned. I'm seeing a fishing boat. He's a smoker. Um, I think, I'm hearing the name Jan, and for some reason I'm thinking Denmark. And like I said, my eyes are closed. I'm just holding her hands. And then there's something about he never got to tell your mother that he loved her. You know, it's your grandfather on the mom's side. So, you know, I did my makeup. I opened my eyes, and it's like, okay, it's your turn. It's just, there's just streams of tears coming down her cheeks. Her grandfather on her mom's side was named Jan. He lived in Denmark. He had the blonde hair, the blue eyes, died of lung cancer, and never did he tell his own daughter that he loved her while he was alive. For the skeptic folks, how the heck did that happen? And if that was possible for me, what else is possible? So I went through that weekend playing medium. Now, most of the time, I have to tell you, I was wrong. Because people came through my mind. It just looked, to me, just looks like my imagination. So how many of you have had dreams that a loved one has come to you? Or you've had a moment that you might be sitting in your car and you think somebody's with you? Yeah, you might shuffle it off like that's not possible. Well, I'm here to tell you it is and it probably was them. I, I'm digressing to where I want to go in my story, but this is irresistible, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, where is heaven? And I say, heaven is closer than you think. Do you know that we are all made up of energy? If you put a camera, if they existed, a little bitty camera inside one of our atoms, you know what it would see? Nothing. All we are is vibrating energy. We live in a very miraculous world that we think things are real. And inside, it's just all energy. 
It's pretty wild. The inner universe and the outer universe are just incredibly, I mean, you just can't explain it. So I believe that like a log that burns, is the log gone after it burns? The energy still exists in the form of heat. If there was a big puddle here after a rainstorm and the water disappears, well, the puddle's gone, but is the water still around somewhere? When we die, our bodies are gone, but our energy still exists. How myself, mediums, any of you who have felt a loved one around you can feel them, see them, sense them is because they're not gone. They're in this invisible space. And as human beings, our voice wants to hold really onto, well, that can't be possible. But I want to tell you something. Around us right now is something we can't see that's very, very real. Things like this contraption I have on my back, this microphone, that somehow my voice is coming from here, and I'm not connected to a cord, and it's coming out there. There's this world of the wireless internet happening around us. We can't see it, but we know it's real. GPS signals are coming down from satellites, and who knows how that even happens. And they're real, and we can't see them. How does our cell phone work? Who knows? 150 years ago, if you were to tell mankind that there's this thing called the automobile, and inside it is going to be this little box that you're going to hear people speaking and you're going to hear music, people would say, that's not possible. Music comes from instruments. Voices come from human mouths. Impossible. The voice inside of our heads wants to convince us that what we see and we can touch and we can hear is reality. Hundreds of years ago, people didn't just believe that the earth was flat. They knew it. I mean, they knew it. And there's a lot of skeptics out there that know that life after death is not possible, not even willing to be open about it. Hundreds of years ago, poor Galileo even got put in jail for two years before he died because, yeah, the earth is round. And no, the earth isn't the middle of our universe. There's something called a solar system, and the sun's in the center. And he got jailed for that. And finally, I think it was the 1500s, Magellan circumnavigates the globe in his ship and proves that the earth is round. But still people believed it was flat. So the voice inside your head is not your friend. It's not your enemy, because we, we all have it. But it's not who we really are. Um, a kind of a funny story, and then I'll get back to some more of my proof that I found, was I have this image. Because if we're here on planet Earth and we don't die, what the heck is the purpose? So where this came to me, I don't know. But does anybody like amusement parks? Yeah. Not all of us like roller coasters, but I remember being a kid and when Space Mountain came out for the first time, man, that was cool. And I had to be on that ride. So when I went on the ride, there's, like in the airports, you know, you're going back and forth, back and forth. And you get to assign 45 minutes, you know, and tell the ride, oh. So I have this picture that there's this place, you can call it heaven, you can call it the hereafter, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But there's this place that exists that is so good and it's so wonderful and it's all wonderful all the time and everything you want. It's right there, just right there for you. And that's eternity. Isn't that wonderful that this place exists? And no. Because you know what's wrong if you have all good all of the time? I think it would get tremendously boring. Anybody have a favorite food? What is it? Anybody want to share? Macaroni, Macaroni and cheese macaroni and cheese. You think of the macaroni, you think of, you could do different noodles, right? You could do different kinds of cheese. You could have four cheese, macaroni and cheese. But if you had to only eat macaroni and cheese for the rest of your life, exactly, she just went, oh. Yeah, so I know this is being playful, but what if the whole reason of coming here 
is to experience. We've got to be able to feel bad to know what it feels like to feel good. If we didn't have sadness, we wouldn't know what joy feels like. I live in Massachusetts, very close to the water, and I love the ocean. You know how many times I went to the ocean in the last five years? Maybe twice. Ah, no big deal. You can see it any time. So I don't appreciate it. So here on planet Earth, well, this is the place. So, this, so just imagine there's this little soul in this beautiful place called heaven. And everything's good all the time. And it gets boring. So all of a sudden he sees one of these lines forming, like at Disney. And he's like, what's that? Somebody says, you don't know, that's planet Earth. You can go there and it's not boring. You can go, you're gonna, you're gonna get a body, and with this body you get five senses. See, here in heaven, everything just happens kind of like in a dreamlike state. I mean, you and I know that you could imagine right now what a piece of chocolate would taste like on your tongue, right? But what if you really had a piece of chocolate? Whole different experience. So going to this planet Earth, you get these five senses. And not only that, you get something called emotions. You get to feel. Yes, there's going to be good. Yes, there's going to be bad. But there's so much to discover and explore. There's other people to deal with. You know, isn't this going to be exciting? You just got to go. And so the thing about it, though, is we make a deal. And again, there's no guarantees. But this is what I choose to believe to empower me. We make this deal that we're going to come to this place of Earth. We're going to learn how to love, learn how to forgive. We're going to playful out and get as much as we can to learn so that our souls grow and maybe move on to a higher realm. But we make this deal that when we get here, we're going to forget who we really are. We're going to get this thing called the voice that's going to nonstop be talking to you, trying to convince you that it's reality. There's a really good way to quiet the voice, and it is to try to stop our thinking. Some of us have tried to meditate or even a few deep breaths just concentrating on your breath can put you in that, that peaceful state. If you have, are you suffering pain, even if it's mental pain and all this thought, if you're sitting behind the wheel of your car and you're hanging on and you don't pay attention to anything else but the grip of the wheel and you're just present with how your fingers feel, suddenly the voice goes away. While you're eating, and you eat something, instead of paying attention to everything else that's going on or the television, take the time to savor each morsel. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, because I've talked to enough mediums and psychics, that they get their information when their mind is quiet. I also know people like Albert Einstein and Henry Ford and Steve Jobs and Tina Turner and some people that have created some unbelievable works of art and music. How they get their inspiration is to go to that quiet place. I know that quiet place helps relieve the pain of grief as well. Because we can't think two thoughts at the same time. You can't be paying attention to one thing and being in the present moment as well. And one of the things playfully that I say also is we have all over in every country these things called stop signs. And if you can use that stop sign, red stop sign here in North America or wherever you may live as a reminder to stop the inner chatter, you'll be amazed at not only connecting with your loved ones, but also you might get some really great divine ideas, new ideas or there's some healing that can occur. So a couple other things that I learned in my journey is I know you all know Dr. Raymond Moody, who was here last year. He was the gentleman that coined the phrase near-death experience. And it's very easy for the skeptic to believe that near-death experience, oh, that's just what happens when the body shuts down. Well, of course, Dr. Raymond Moody and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and I mean, there's been hundreds of thousands of documentation of, of people that not just have seen the light, but very specific things that happen in the dying process. Uh, one of my race car drivers saw my sign about life after death, and he's pretty famous, and he's now a TV announcer, and he said, Sandra, what's this all about? And I told him, and he said, I've never told anybody this story, but in the 70s, he said, I actually died on an operating table after a terrible car crash. 
And he said, I was greeted by my grandmother and my grandfather. And he says, in a world that made this life seem like just a dream. And he said, it was awesome. But then he said he looked down, he could see his body, and he could see in the waiting room his mom and dad and his brother praying for him. So he felt like he had the choice, and he came back to life. And he woke up, and of course he's filled with pain because he had to have tons of surgery. But he said, why that changed my life has been not being afraid of dying. I wasn't afraid of living. So he says he's a race car driver. So he put his foot on the pedal further than anybody did, driving 200 miles an hour. He won championships. He's you know, a NASCAR driver, done all kinds of things because he wasn't afraid. And what if, without having to have a near-death experience, like we aren't afraid to live our life and live, live it fully. So after Dr. Raymond Moody, there's a guy named Dr. Ken Ring who also studied near-death experiences. But not just near-death experiences of people, he chose blind people to study, people that never had had vision. And you know what? They had vision for the very first time in that in-between place. It's amazing. Dr. Um, Ian Stevenson spent his life on the world of reincarnation and has over 3,000 documented stories of children who had claimed to be someone in a past life only to find out that those people actually did exist. Now for the skeptic, no, that's impossible. But I'm asking you to consider that that's the voice talking. There's a woman named uh, Reverend Rita Berkowitz. And in my journey, I wanted to learn, could I perfect this medium thing? And by the way, I haven't. Um, <laughs> So I go into the bookstore and I see The Idiot's Guide to Communicating with Spirits. <laughs> really is such a book. And within her book, she's not only a medium, but she's a minister of the spiritualist church. And I don't know if you know too much about spiritualism, but uh, Sir Arthur Conan, Conan Doyle and even Abraham Lincoln believed in spiritualism. Um, it, is, it felt like a Christian-based service, but at the end of the service, the minister would come out and say who the, your deceased loved ones are around you. And also throughout her book, she's not only a medium, but she's an artist. So when she takes you in as a client, she's like, you know, she's telling you who's around you. Oh, she's drawing a picture. So throughout the book are pictures of who she saw and people as they lived. And they're the same people. So in my journey, I thought, well, how in the world do I find a spiritualist church? Because I, I certainly want to go to one. Well, I turned to the back of the book. Reverend Rita Berkowitz and her church were 45 minutes away from me in Massachusetts. Of course, right? So it is clear to me that I am a messenger of some sort, that this message is not about Sandra Champlain, but I am the mouthpiece for it. I can cook for 1,500 people. I know how to make hundreds of pounds of chicken. I have stamina. I have strength. I can be up for my last race. I was cooking for 40 hours straight at a 24-hour race. I have this image that whoever's up in the universe is saying, let's give this message to that girl. <laughs> so I decide to meet Rita Berkowitz and go to her church, and it was lovely. And she invited me back the following week. And the following week, there were some guest ministers. And the man got up at the end of the service, and he said, you know, I never believed in anything, life after death, because we can't prove it. But he says, I found something, and I think you'd be interested in. It's called electronic voice phenomena, EVP. And he says, out in the world, there was just a movie that came out that was called White Noise. And it was a horror movie, right? And he said, but here's the thing, that's all Hollywood, none of that is true. And he said, my wife and I have both lost children in past marriages. And he said, I literally had a digital tape recorder in our room with just a fan blowing in the background. And we left the house for 20 minutes. And he said, when we came back in and we pressed played, there, and he played it for us, there was a message that said, little laughing, and it said, Daddy, don't be scared. We're still here with you. And I spent a long time researching 
electronic voice phenomena. I even took, because now this is really starting to sound wild. You know, for the skeptic, this is really out there. Um, but I, I went for a weekend with a couple called Tom and Lisa Butler, who run the Association for Electronic Voice Phenomena. They're not the founders of it all, but they've been doing it for 25 years. And on a Saturday night that I was just trying desperately to get one of these recordings, I had my digital tape recorder and me, and I'm sitting in my cabin all alone with raindrops that are falling outside. And I just said, to, I'm imagining my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt and uncle at the foot of the bed. I didn't really think they were there. But I said, if you guys are here, and this is real, and I'm supposed to make a difference helping people, I said, I need you to talk really loud <laughs> and try to get something on this recorder. And so I said, I'm going to let it record, and then I'll say good night. And so I press record, let, just let it do its thing, and then I press play. And when I played it back, on the second, I'm counting the seconds, on the second number 46, I hear a man's voice say, good night, Sandra. Two women whisper, good night, good night. And then a final voice says, good night. That moment both changed my life and scared the heck out of me. <laughs> and there actually is a book out called Do Dead People Watch Me in the Shower? <laughs> because the answer is no. <laughs> I, think, I think in the hereafter, there is so much more learning to be done. But I think in a moment, people could, can be here with us. I've, I've worked with people privately, I've never charged a penny, and I've recorded over 200 messages to help people through their, their grief, their loss, and every time somebody's heard a message. And just to prove that love is not gone, one, of the, one man was in Australia when I talked to him on the phone. He says, let's see if my wife can show up in Byfield, Massachusetts. And so I did the recording. I said, I'll call you back in an hour, because it takes a long time to go through to listen for the whispers. And what I heard was, she's a better housekeeper than me. I love you, Duncan. I hear what sounds like singing in French. And I hear Pepe La Pew. Pepe La Pew. Pepe La Pew. And remember the skunk, Pepe La Pew, the character? So I call Duncan. And now Duncan is a very well-known artist. And I tell him, he says, well, you know what? She was a better housekeeper than the new wife. He says, my mother sang me French lullabies. And she said, he said, I used to call my grandfather Pepe La Pew. Amazing. One thing I give people as a gift within We Don't Die, and again, I got my five-minute warning, so I'm like, oh, there's so much more I want to say. <laughs> I can't. So you can, you can take the book, spend the day with it, all that. Um, but there's something called remote viewing. And it's an ESP technique that I took a course with Russell Targ, who's a physicist. He actually invented the laser beam, one of the founding fathers. And this is something you can practice with each other or do alone. You can have a magazine in front of you that you've never opened before. You can have a friend put something in a shoebox or hide something in a bag. And if you are to quiet your mind, remember, your mind is going to want to fight you, that this isn't real, and play the game, if I was psychic, what would be in that bag? And although you might not know what the thing is, you will see images. After my grandmother died, I bought her favorite magazine, which was Woman's World. And I just was playing to see if this was even possible. And I had the intention, what was on page 29? And I, all of a sudden, I see a Statue of Liberty, Abraham Lincoln, Ladybug, a train, you know, a glass of Chardonnay, well, I think white wine, ice, different things. And I'm writing all this stuff down. I turn to page 29. Nothing was there. So I thought, well, that doesn't work. Well, I decided to read Woman's World. Page 3, Abraham Lincoln. Page 5, Statue of Liberty. There was the glass of wine. There was the Ladybug. Like 75% of what I saw up here was there. And why I feel so 
that I need to share this. And there's, gosh, there's like 12 other things that I haven't had the time to share with you guys right now, so I'm sorry. Um, but when we can experience that we are so much more than our bodies, and we can embrace that, that possibility that life after death is real, and your loved ones are not gone, they may be sitting in the chair right here, right now with you. As my dad, I think, is my partner getting this message out. Dad died a terrible cancer with as much suffering as one could imagine. And I have no answer for why, that's, why that has to happen that bad. But I know one thing for sure. I can live my life a victim of the pain of what I've experienced and let it hold me back. Or I can play the game that I am that soul that came down to earth to learn. And this is what I've learned. And I want to be able to give that. And I, like you, my little motto is, I want you to play full out and get your money's worth out of life. I want you to know every fear that comes up, and they are scary, and I know, but how to get to the other step through that fear, and that's where the good stuff is. In closing, I just want to say, we as human beings have three fears. One is the fear of failure, one is the fear of being alone, and the other is the fear of dying. Well, if we can really embrace that we don't die, that we are never alone. And failure is just an illusion because everything that we experience right now is education for our soul. Relationships may go sour. There might be things to mend. But before you go to bed tonight, I want you to just imagine if this was your last night, and I don't want to be morbid or anything, but eventually it's going to happen. You're going to close your eyes and you're going to, wake, you're going to open them to some other place because that is reality. But instead of going back on your life and looking at the regrets, which is what most people do, by the way, you know, look to see what is left unsaid to someone. Look in your heart to see what dreams you still have. It's never too late. And again, just play full out and get your money's worth out of our life here on planet Earth. So that's it for me. And I thank you all for being here.